private sector. This is not something that uh, government is just going to quickly write your great big check and say, you're right, go do it. Uh, it's going to require the engagement of the private sector, and how can we do that better? I, I think that um, on on issues in cities, whether it's libraries or job creation, um, local governments, uh, cities recognize that you know you 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 don't you can't do it alone. Um, and when we can frame the discussion with the private sector that this is um, a quality of life issue, this is an economic development issue, and that we need the support, uh, whether it's intellectual, their thought leadership, as well as their money, to be able to support. Um, in Palm Beach County, we had friends of libraries, our foundations or our councils getting them involved. Um, I think we can make this um, a real issue of concern for the private sector because if they don't have an educated community and a workforce and one that has access um, to uh, technology and, and to close that digital gap, they too will not succeed economically and they won't have the workforce that they will need. So th there is a need, but we have to go to them, and, and the librarians have to change um, the way in which we advocate. Great, thank you. Other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Adam Eisbrow with the ALA Washington office. A uh, question for anybody, but Mr. Gordon in particular. Uh, is there uh, statistical evidence now, and if not, what kind would you outline as necessary in order to show the correlation hard data correlation between reduced unemployment and increased uh, access and increased savings? There is, in terms of your question, evidence from a study done by Sharon Sturver at the University of Texas and others that shows in rural areas in particular an increase in employment that uh, was linked with an increase in broadband adoption, and that's controlling for all the things you'd want to control for and using the fanciest statistical techniques. There, so that's one study. I think we do need to get more studies like that out there. It's a difficult thing from a social science perspective, which is why the study I cited is so important, because um, it was actually an easier proposition 10 years ago or, or a dozen years ago to look at that because we were going from a situation where lots of places didn't even have infrastructure for broadband to a time a couple of years uh, forward when they did, at a time when a lot of places did have access, um, in network infrastructure in place. So that going from almost n nothing to robust coverage in some areas kind of uh, set up a natural experiment. But I do think, um, to the point of, of the role that research plays in all this is that we need in this sector to do, a, a, I think, a better job of assessing program outcomes so that you do have that intellectual backup to go with policymakers and other fields like employment and uh, labor training programs. Um, assessment goes along with some of the federal funds that go to it, whereas um, we haven't quite gotten there yet with uh, information technology. Um, encourage digital readiness with uh, the older generations, people in their 60s, 70s, and above, who are still maybe getting their first email address, and they don't use it. Well, I'll start real quickly with an example from New York City. Um, older Americans Technology Services is, de is devoted to precisely that, um, has gotten some uh, BTOP funding, I believe, yeah. and it is a dedicated program that aims at senior citizens. It's very much a boots on the ground, um, face-to-face kind of um, oh, interview. Yeah, oh, it's older American technology services. So um, others had some comments, I think, on this topic, so I'll sure. turn it over. Go ahead, Mitch. Um, I was actually gonna mention OAT as, as a group that we worked with. Um, in, in, in New York uh, with BTOP funding, absolutely. Um, you know, there are other anecdotal things that we've tried in libraries, uh, sort of connecting uh, grandparents to the power of shared media um, is something that's really, really of interest to them so that they can remain connected with their grandkids, things like that. Um, 
but it's a, it's a captive audience, and I think that libraries really haven't been doing enough to, in, to engage seniors. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's ripe for growth for sure. One of the things that I'm seeing in libraries across the country is um, targeted programs for teaching seniors access to newspapers. More and more newspapers in towns are um, converting to mostly digital or totally digital delivery and it's leaving out a lot of our seniors. And so um, there are special training classes to help seniors get comfortable with accessing good information and news information online. Uh, so I have actually seen that in, uh, in various libraries. And I think um, another thing that a lot of libraries are starting to think about is going outside of the library into senior centers and other situations with equipment and with uh, the training and so taking it to seniors where they already are in order to um, facilitate their training. I do not have specific statistics. I would say it is a national crisis. Um, we have um, communities in the country that have absolutely no certified school librarians in the entire K-12 arena. Um, the, as you say, the problem is more severe in elementary schools. A lot of states do require a certified librarian at the secondary level, do not require a librarian at the elementary level. And what we find is that um, sometimes school districts try to compensate by using volunteers or aides. And what that does is it cuts out the instructional role. So the library, if there is still a library space, is not really a library because it's a simple repository and the reading guidance and the instruction in the critical literacy skills does not happen. And it is uh, really a crisis. I see various points of hope. I think administrators are starting to understand the essential nature of this instruction. So I, I think it's turning, but we have a ways to go. Thank you. Next question. Can you repeat this? I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. did you have a question? <laughs> sorry. Uh -huh. Probably for Barbara, but really for anybody, though. Sure. Talking about bridging the digital divide, and in terms of school age children, though, would curriculum be an option in terms of that? When I was in school, we had typing classes, and also taught basic computing. But if you're talking about third grade, fourth grade, and younger than that, would Um, I'm right there with you. <laughs> when I was in New York City, uh, one of the major things that we did was to build a K through 12 information fluency continuum, we called it, because you have to start from the second that students are, are there in the schools, and it needs to build grade by grade so that you are developing the thoughtfulness and the, and the ability to use this technology and any resources all the way through. Otherwise, you can't just drop in and have it at one grade level. The curriculum, however, I, I want to say is best delivered in partnership with classroom teachers. It doesn't do a lot of good to just have a timeout, now we're going to learn this. But if you integrate it into what's happening within the classrooms, that's really powerful because then they have to use the skills. And as you use it uh, to learn something you want to learn, then it's solidified. 
So I, I totally agree with you. That's essential. And just on the access part of that question, as it goes to the digital divide, there's the Comcast Internet Essentials program, which is aimed at getting broadband to families with school-age children who are eligible for free and reduced-price lunch um, <coughs> to get them access to the Internet, and that's through a 9.95 per month uh, service offer for five megabits down, one up, um, a reduced-price computer, and access to um, training resources. Uh, so um, that's one way um, so that the students who may benefit from that kind of curricula also have access at home, which, of course, the vast majority of their peers do, but there are definite pockets of low access among um, low-income families. Can I say one more thing? Certainly. Sorry. Um, one piece that I didn't mention before that we really need to consider is the idea of digital citizenship skills. And that is um, not only safety online, which all of our students need to learn, but it's also responsibility online. So it is the way that you interact with others um, and also the responsibility of every, every person to seek multiple perspectives and to seek the valid perspectives. So that is built in to the curriculum that school librarians teach. And actually, you'll find that in E-Rate. One of the requirements is that students learn these digital citizenship skills. And school librarians stepped up and said, absolutely, this is a part of our curriculum. And we want to make sure that every one of our students is safe and responsible online. 